Anybody ever heard or said the statement, the struggle is real? How many of you say it on a daily? Come on, somebody. You know, we came out of 21 days of prayer and fasting and did 21 days without coffee. The struggle is real, right? Some people think when they think about the uh, garden and when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit they weren't supposed to take of, they, they imagine an apple. I imagine a coffee bean. I feel like that was the thing, like, I can't live without this. Um, how many of you know uh, sometimes when the Wi-Fi is slow, the struggle is real? Um, when you, your phone is almost dead and you have no charger, the struggle is real. Come on, somebody. Um, it was funny, Miss Sunny, who's new to our worship team, she sang. Didn't Miss Sunny do an incredible job, man? She was awesome. And so I told her, just because you're new to the band doesn't mean you don't get roasted, you know. And so today she was back there, and it was so funny because she was uh, trying to get ice out of the refridge, refrigerator. And she puts the cup up there. And I mean, like, not even a half second into pushing the button. She's like, does this ice maker work? And I was like, Sonny, you have to, like, give it more than, like, one second. Like, you know, she's like, why didn't it work? I said, because that machine requires patience. I mean, you know, the struggle is real. Come on. Uh, sometimes, like, we have, everybody has a different definition of struggle. Can we agree with that? And uh, it's kind of like I took my oldest daughter and Tia, who also sings, the, I took them to uh, the, one of the Vols games this past fall. And uh, they blew my mind because if you don't know this, Gen Z has their own language. They do. You have to, like, find an interpreter. You have to really look up stuff, figure things out. And they kept saying the stuff like this. I realized that they have a different definition of the word literally. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, they kept saying these words literally all day. You ever heard people say, like, I literally died? Like, literally. I'm thinking, I don't think you know what that word means. And so what I found is when Gen Z says literally, they mean metaphorically. If they say actually, they mean literally. And so they would say, like, actually. I'm like, okay, so you're saying that really happened. Okay, I got it. But if they said literally, just know that's not what really happened. That's a metaphor, okay? The struggle is real, <laughs> trying to decipher the language. Um, I know a little bit about struggle. You know, I grew up in struggle. My, my mom was a kid raising a kid. She was 15 when she had me. And, um, you know, I think about some of my childhood moments growing up in a ton of dysfunction, abuse, addiction, um, all those different things. And I can remember being even an eighth grader. And if you know anything about middle school, those are really some huge formative years for self-confidence, how we see ourselves, how we view people, how we view life. And um, we didn't have a lot. We lived in and out of motels. We lived in and out of apartment complexes. In fact, it wasn't until my sophomore year uh, when my mother reconnected with my biological father. That's a whole other story. Uh, but we actually moved to Murfreesboro. It was the first time we, like, bought a house. And I remember that house had a basketball goal out back. Listen, I was in heaven, y'all. Like, I thought, man, I finally arrived. I, I have a house. Like, this is our house. I have my own basketball goal. Um, on the playground is where I spent most of my days. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and, uh, and so, like, I thought, man, this is it. And, that, of course, we, that only lasted a year. And after that year, that's when my mother really dove deep into her drug addiction. She ended up going to prison. I was in high school and uh, ended up living with my aunt and uncle through all of high school. But in middle school, I remember being in eighth grade wearing the same tennis shoes from sixth grade. And so, like, my shoes had holes in them. Most of my clothes were borrowed, tattered, all these different things. And so imagine, like, trying to fit in. I moved from school to school, and so every year was almost trying to, like, find new relationships and friendships. And so I kind of medicated through laughter. You know, I was the class clown because if I could get them to laugh with me, now they're not laughing at me. And, and so what I know is that, like, growing up, uh, I think about a lot of things that I struggle through. And, and listen, I'm grateful for a lot of those struggles because a lot of those struggles are who made me who I am today. I think there's some things that I, I've come to value out of my struggles. I value hard work. I value excellence. I value taking care of my stuff. It's one of the things I try to teach my kids. Like, they have things that I never had growing up. And so take care of these things, like you have these blessings. In fact, one of my greatest fears as a dad is that 
because my kids don't struggle the way I struggle, they never learn what it means to persevere. They never know what it means to actually walk through something they can't control but overcome and, and actually have something positive come from those struggles because they don't. And I'm grateful that they're not exposed to the things I was exposed to. But as a dad, I'm always wrestling through how do I expose them to struggle? How do I let them suffer a few consequences so that way they can learn to overcome their mistakes and all of those different things? The problem is this. And God really convicted me as I was walking through studying this, is that if you're here today and you're like me and you walk through struggle, there is a huge temptation to idolize your struggle. And what I mean is, is that there's even part of us that if we're really, because what birth, what, I, I do value hard work, I do value excellence, but let me tell you what I also valued out of coming out of my dysfunction and my struggle. I valued possessions way too much. I valued people's affirmation and love way too much. I value comfort, safety, and security over the unknown way too much. And what begins to happen is is it's formative in us because all of us have something that we've walked through in our life that forms something internal in us that becomes our attachment or our idol that we begin to worship. Some of us idolize our struggle because we use it as the excuse as to why we behave the way we behave. Well, if you only knew how I grew up, if you only knew what I had to go through, and what God really broke me from was that, yeah, you've overcome a lot except for the idol of you trying to overcome your own insecurities by providing for yourself. Because here's what I want you to know. I did not get myself out of my struggle. I did not, I did not pull myself up by my bootstraps and get me to where I'm at today. God did that. In fact, if, we, if you grew up in church, here's the greatest temptation you have. you have. You grow up thinking that the only thing that separates you from other bad people is going off the deep end. In other words, people say stuff like this. They say, in order for people to find God, they've got to hit rock bottom. And what I want to tell you is that everyone starts off at rock bottom. It's just that most of us are too prideful to see it. And so we say things like, you know, I don't really have a testimony. I didn't like, I didn't start doing drugs or drinking or sleeping around with everybody. So, you know, I don't, you know, I don't really have a testimony. You have the same testimony I do. You, you were once dead, now you're alive. You were once lost, now you were found. It's the same testimony. And so the problem is, is that we idolize our experiences and our struggles. And for some people, um, we've come to this place where we are either, don't miss this, we are either struggling toward comfort, or we are struggling toward Christ. And so I've had to like, in my, and this is, I'm just being truly authentic with you today because this is something that God has really wrecked me over and trying to, this is part of my discipleship. Your your pastor has not got it all figured out, but I'm a man in formation too. I'm trying to separate my identity from what I do that my identity is not found in being your pastor. If tomorrow, I mean, that was my prayer this morning. God, I, today I give you my resignation. If you want me to move on to something else, I will gladly do it because I don't need this to survive. You are not my oxygen. He is. But can I tell you, that's a struggle for me. It's a struggle not to find my worth built on what other people say or think about me. That's a struggle. That's my struggle. I'm just being authentic. But I have to get to this place. I have to, in my discipleship to Jesus, allow God to strip away all of my idols and all of my things that I tend to cling to instead of clinging to him. And so the question I want us to wrestle with today is how does God use my struggle to strengthen my faith? How does God use my struggle? Now notice that we're saying, how do, I, how do I allow God to use my struggle to strengthen my faith? Not my, not my sense of security, not my sense of trusting in my own self, because that's pride. And actually, pride and insecurity are the same thing. Insecurity just means that I am not secure in who God created me to be, so I must do something to make myself secure. Are you all following me so far? Because we're going to see how all this ties in. I'm trying to set, set it up for us to dive into this conversation. Mark 6 is um, an incredible chapter. I actually love this. Mark 
if you don't know the theme throughout Mark's writings, and if you remember what we've been talking about this for several weeks, that Mark focuses on more of the actions of Jesus more than the words of Jesus. That's just, he's, he's telling his part of the story. He's actually telling Peter's part of the story and, and what Jesus did. But he does something what's, what a lot of people call the Mark sandwich. And um, I call it uh, stacking the teachings. Because sometimes if you're not careful, when you read the Bible, it's really easy to just like read one paragraph and then like, okay, this next paragraph is totally unrelated. And this next paragraph is totally unrelated. But it's actually all related. Chapter 6 is all related to one common theme that Mark's actually trying to teach us. It's called the Mark sandwich. You'll see one. In, you'll see kind of an event happen on the front end, an event happen on the back end, and in between, he's teaching us something that connects the two events. So what you see, Mark six opens. Jesus goes back to Sticktown. If you were here at Christmas, you know what Sticktown is, Nazareth, right? He goes back to Sticktown. He's in his hometown where he grew up, and the Bible says that they reject him. He's like, look, the Messiah's here, and they're like, the Messiah? you Mary and Joseph's son. Boy, I changed your diaper when you were little. You're trying to tell me you're God. I don't think so. Like, they had a hard time seeing him for who he really was. And then what do we see? We see that his cousin, John the Baptist, is beheaded. He dies. So he's wrestling with the emotion of that. And then he, he feeds the 5,000 in the desert. And then they get into this boat again. And they go to the other side, and it finishes. This is odd, right? We th- again, it seems so random, but it's not. Remember, this, chapter 6 starts with an entire village rejecting him, and then he gets to a Gentile village, and immediately they receive him. Incredible, right? We're going to talk about this. We're going to tie it all together, I promise, when we get to the end. So now, here's what's fascinating. We see that Jesus gets these guys. He's like, listen, go ahead and get in the boat, go to the other side. Notice no one asked Jesus, Jesus, how are you going to get there? And I can only imagine that, you know, Peter's already made a fool of himself several times, and they're like, I ain't asking him nothing. Peter doesn't look stupid several times. I ain't looking stupid today. They're just assuming Jesus got another boat, right? So he's like, you guys get in the boat. I'll meet you over there. And they do. Where does Jesus go? Up on the hills, right? To do what? To pray. Now, all this is intentional. Now, when I went to Israel, um, we got to actually go up on the mountain in Tiberias or in the Galilee area where they believe that Jesus would have went many times to isolate and pray. Because you see this several times in Scripture that Jesus would go off to himself, usually up in a mountainous area, to pray. And this one particular mountain, not only was it outside of Galilee, it was away from everybody. It was high enough to see over the entire area of Galilee and the Sea of Galilee. So I'll show you a few pictures. Here's the first one. So you can see the Sea of Galilee. We're standing on top of the mountain here looking down. You can see the entire valley. In fact, go ahead and go to the next one. You can actually see over to Syria right here. So you're seeing across the sea uh, or this lake into Syria. People, This was like a, um, I want to say it was like a mile and a half hike up to this mountain. Um, and then go to the next one. Again, you can tell my fear of heights. That's about as close as to the edge that I wanted to get. You know, I'm like, <laughs> full extension, take the picture. Um, but in this, could you imagine, like, being up there as Jesus prayed and he's looking over the people that he's praying for. But the point is, he could have seen the storm rise up and see them struggling on the sea. Go ahead and go to the next one. But this is the entire, you can see the entire valley, all of Galilee, um, where Jesus did the majority of his ministry. Pretty powerful, right? So Jesus is up here, and he's praying over them, and they encounter another storm. So there's two things that I want us to see and dive into about this text that I believe that God is trying to communicate and that Mark is trying to communicate to us. One is this, Jesus brings calm to chaos. Jesus brings calm to chaos. Because here's the thing, how long did Jesus watch them struggle? Because the Bible says that he sees them rowing hard and struggling, but the Bible does not say that he immediately got up and went to help them. I mean, you just picture Jesus like, huh, look at those guys. (laughs) 
Anyways, <laughs> you know, like just going back to prayer. Because it just says like, and at 3 a.m., Jesus shows up on the water, right? But here's where it gets really interesting. The Bible says that he intended to go past them. And I'm like, what is happening here? And so we see this moment where it says he intended to go past them. And remember, we've been talking about design patterns. In other words, that the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, there are these design patterns that are pointing to Christ in the future. And that everything Jesus did was basically fulfilling what they said about God in the Hebrew Bible. That everything is about revealing his identity. And so we see yet another design pattern here. If you've been here the last several weeks and we've been talking about this, that the sea in the Bible was never, anytime you talk about the sea in the Bible, it did not represent peace and tranquility. It represents chaos. It represents disorientation. It represents confusion. Go all the way back to the creation story. God separates the chaos from life by creating land. Land is a place of nourishment and life. We see this story actually reflects the Exodus story. Because remember, in Hebrews, the Bible says that Jesus is a much better Moses. Every single major character you know in the Hebrew Bible is actually pointing to a more perfect version of themselves in Jesus. Because we know that Moses, as great as he was, he was not perfect. And so here's Jesus. Look at the correlation. You have the feeding of the 5,000. Well, where do you see magic bread coming in the desert? Manna in the desert. Then you have Jesus who goes up on a mountain, and the Bible says this. It's so intentional. He says he puts the disciples in the boat alone. Why is that so key? Well, remember what Moses did. He goes up on Sinai to go meet with God, and he leaves Israel alone. And guess what happens the moment he leaves them alone? Chaos ensues. Are y'all with me? And then we see a parting of the Red Sea and a crossing of the sea. Both are crossings. It's the design pattern. And what Jesus is actually trying to lead his disciples to understand is you need to prepare for what you are about to face in this world for the years to come. Because we have to know the moment Jesus shows up in your life, the age of sin and death will do everything it can to pull you back into the waters of chaos. You will face struggles. The the way of Jesus is the good life. It is not the easy one. Why? Because it is anti the age of sin and death. And this world filled with sin and chaos and disorientation and confusion is constantly trying to pull you back into its waters. Are y'all with me? That's why, like, the moment you came to Christ, you're like, man, I'm so excited. I love Jesus. You know, you come up out of the baptistry, everybody's like, woo, let's go. And then a week later, you're still wrestling. In fact, most of your temptations and things you wrestle with are now coming to the light even heavier. And you're like, why am I still struggling? Because you correlated that, man, the moment you gave your life to Christ, you, you made it an emotional moment, not realizing that now all of hell itself is trying to pull you back into chaos. And so he's teaching them. They just left a moment of nourishment and are heading into the waters of chaos. And so here's where it gets really good, y'all. Verse 48, he says this, he saw that they were in serious trouble rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. Two words here I want to point out. If you know anything about the New Testament, it was originally written in the language of Greek. There is a Greek word here that is actually used throughout the Hebrew Bible. It's a word called, excuse me, basanizo. Basanizo. And so it means painful rowing or torment. The Bible says he saw them Basanizo, they were rowing hard, and they were in torment. Why is this so important? This same Greek word was used in Mark chapter 5. And in Mark chapter 5, Jesus shows up. Remember, it's the same, the other boat crossing. He gets to the other side. What does Jesus encounter when he gets to the other side? A man possessed by many demons. His name was Legion. And the Bible says that when Jesus got to the shore, the demons saw him from a distance, and they came running out. And guess what he said to Jesus? Are you here to basanizo me? Are you here to torment me? 
throw against me. And then he says this. He says, he saw them struggling against the wind and waves. It actually means, it's a Greek word called ilano, which means driven. So they are tormented by something. Don't miss this. They are tormented by a condition they cannot control. And being driven towards a place that they did not want to go. And here's what's amazing. It's the same word used when Jesus drives out demonic possession. They are in Bostonizo, and he comes to Alano. And so the question I have for you is this. What are you driven by that Christ needs to drive out? What are you driven by that Christ needs to drive out? Fear, lust, addiction, anxiety, bitterness, disobedience. You realize that all of your chaos is internal, right? We like to think that chaos is all of the external things that happen to us, but it's what's actually happening in us that determines how we handle what happens outside of us. Are y'all understanding me today? Every chaos that Jesus came to drive out in your life is not your circumstance, but it is what is happening in the heart of your life. That most of our issues stem from some sort of inner turmoil that we are not allowing Christ to deal with in our lives. Some people you're blaming like other people or other situations in your life, but God's trying to deal with your heart. Some of you are like, man, I need God to change my financial situation. You know, like, no, God needs to change the way you perceive finances. Your problem is you don't have enough, the problem is not that you don't have enough money, the problem is that you don't handle it very well. You know, it was amazing, my mom struggled with those things all of her life. I grew up, because of those struggles, we grew up what was called a poverty mindset. Here's what I want you to know about a poverty mindset. A poverty mindset does not mean you don't have money. A poverty mindset means that money is something that will go away soon. And so if you have it, you must spend it for yourself because it's the only thing that's going to bring security, comfort, and identity. Are you all with me? And so we would be people who couldn't even afford rent. We're staying in a motel room. but My mom made sure she had cartons of cigarettes. We see it today. And listen, I want you to know, man, my mama's in heaven. She got saved, delivered. Sometimes, I'm not, I know, when I get up there, she's like, we need to have a conversation. You've been telling way too many stories on me. <laughs> I know what she's thinking right now, but, she's, but I want you to know, she's good. Her and Jesus are good. She got delivered. She's in heaven. But, but I want you, I'm just being authentic. I'm being authentic about the struggle. That's why you see today, America is the only place where you can be poor and homeless and still have an iPhone and still have enough money to buy cigarettes or whatever it is you're addicted to for the week. Happens all the time. I see kids in elementary school all the time. They cannot afford lunch, but the parents have enough money to supply for their own habits. Why? Because there's something internal that's got to be dealt with. And what you will intend to do is that now you will go to everybody else trying to fix your external problems, but you will not go to Jesus to drive out your internal issue. When that's the chaos that has to be dealt with. Some of you is like, man, my husband, you just don't understand my husband. He is blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, actually what happened was you didn't marry him for the right reasons. And now you're dealing with external issues because you couldn't control your internal chaos because you were driven by lust, greed, and your own emotionalism. And now you're stuck in a relationship you wish you hadn't got into because you thought that he would change. And the problem is not your marriage. The problem is your heart. And you have not dealt with your daddy issues. And because you were abandoned now, you project that on everybody else. You know why I know this? Because I've lived it. This is not a condemning or pointing a finger at. It's saying, guys, I've been on this sea of struggle with you. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not what's outside that is affecting you. It is what is inside. Some of you are like, that's why I don't. Do church because you don't understand, man. The church hurt me. The church was full of hypocrites, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, man, the people are not the problem. It's, it's what's happening inside. 
it's funny when people are like, you know, I just, there's so many hypocrites at church, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, show us how to live, Jesus. You show us how to do it. If you're perfect, but really what is it? It's an excuse to state why, because I have struggled. It becomes our idol. It becomes our excuse. And so Jesus is saying, man, I've come to drive this stuff out. This leads to the next one, which is this. Jesus brings familiarity in the face of fear. This is where it gets so good. And so what Jesus is trying to communicate, man, if I can calm, you've already seen me calm the storm once, but if I can split the seas for Moses, if I can drive out the demon out of the, the man, and uh, if I can drive that out, guess what? I can show up in the midst of your struggle. I can show up in your life. And he does it. This is so fascinating because it's easy for us to write these moments off as like cool party tricks. If you've never really studied the Bible, and like, you probably grew up, you've had some kind of experience where you heard something about Jesus walking on water. And I got to be honest, when you first hear that story, you're just like, what's the place? Is, is Jesus just flexing right here? You know? Like, hey, guys, get in the boat. Watch this. I don't even need a boat. You know, he's like moonwalking across the water, you know. And we're all like, man, Jesus walked on water, you know, like so cool. You know, it makes great for vacation Bible school, but it doesn't really help us in our moment because we're like, I don't get it. But if you were a Hebrew boy in that boat growing up listening to the Hebrew scriptures, God, Jesus is actually showing them something about himself from the Old Testament. This is so good, y'all. And so notice this. When he says that he intended to pass them by, it's a Greek word known as perikomai. Perikomai. Now, why is that important? Because this word is used throughout the Old Testament in several similar stories. Remember, we talked about how the story of Jesus is such a, it's such a Christ type of the Exodus story. I want you to see something God does. There's a moment when Moses is struggling leading the people. I actually had several moments, right? I mean, I can't identify. I mean, you guys are easy to lead. But Moses had, str he had struggles leading people. And here's what he does. Moses does not go to God and ask for more leadership skills. He doesn't go ask for a good motivational speech. He goes to God and says, listen, the only way this is going to happen is I need to know you. And I need to know that your presence is with me. And he says one of the most audacious prayers, y'all. You know what he prays? Show me your glory. If you're with me, show me your glory. Reveal yourself to me so that I know I am not alone in this. And guys, I can't make this stuff up. Remember, Parakamai, passed him by. Look in Exodus 33. This is fascinating. Three different times, just in this story alone. Go ahead and throw it up there. 33, 19. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness Parakamai. Before you. And I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. A few verses down in verse 22. As my glorious presence, Parakomai, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have Parakomai. And look at the last one, heading into verse 6 of chapter 34. The Lord Parakomai in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. You see, the struggle is also where we become familiar with his presence and his voice. He's saying, just as the presence and glory of God passed by, here's what he's saying is that listen, I'm not gonna stop. You're not gonna, you can't see me face to face because you'll die. He's like, but I'm not gonna stay. He's like, I'll just pass by. He says, and if you want to catch a glimpse, you turn your head and catch a glimpse. You know what's fascinating? Is that when the disciples cry out, they say this, is that you? And he doesn't go, yeah, it's me. Jesus, it's me. He actually says something so powerful and intentional. Take courage. 
I am here. Well, where do you see that? In Exodus. Right before Moses, and they split the Red Sea, he tells Moses, be of great courage. I'm with you. Right before Joshua crosses the Jordan River, be of great courage. I am with you. And this is literally translated, I am. Well, where else did, Jesus, where else did God say that? When he met Moses at the burning bush. And here's what's fascinating. He says, when I go back to tell them, and, and they ask me, who sent me? Who do I tell them? He says, tell them I am sent you. The same translation is used here in Mark 6. Jesus is saying, I am Yahweh. I am the one who splits the seas. I am the one who gets you across. I'm the one who provides manna in the desert. I'm the one who brought healing. I'm the one that got you this far. I am him. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, I'm him. It's Yahweh in the flesh. And here's where it gets really good. Do you know how Moses encountered the burning bush? Go back and read the story. There wasn't a burning bush and Moses walking by and the burning bush didn't go, Moses, Moses, it's me in the fire. Look over here. It's fascinating. The Bible says Moses was just guiding his sheep. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says he turned aside and saw, noticed the bush. You know why we don't have these moments where we encounter God's presence? Because we're too busy to turn aside. Do you realize that God's presence is in your everyday life, in ordinary bushes, ordinary moments, but you're looking for people walking on the sea? He's saying, my presence is right here, and this is where it gets really good. You know where else this is found in Scripture? Job chapter 9. Now, if you know anything about Job, you know that guy, just talk about struggle. That guy was in a struggle And in his conversation with God, here's what God points out in the midst of his struggle. Guys, this is so good. The Bible is so amazing. I was geeking out when I read this. Verse 4 of chapter 9, for God is so wise and so mighty, who has ever challenged him successfully? Without warning, he moves the mountains, overturning them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and its foundations tremble. If he commands it, the sun won't rise and the stars won't shine. He alone has spread out the heavens, check this out, and marches on the waves of the sea. He made all the stars, the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the southern sky. He does great things, too marvelous to understand. He performs countless miracles. Check this out, y'all. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. When he paracomies, I do not see him. If he snatches someone in death, who can stop him? Who dares to ask, what are you doing? And God does not restrain his anger. Even the chaos, confusion, and wickedness of the sea, the monsters are crushed beneath his feet. So who am I that I should try to answer God? Wow. He's saying, I'm him. The same Yahweh. And here's what he's saying is, I am involved and active in my creation's life. It's fascinating. So how do, we, how do we actually apply this to our life? Now that we understand what he's trying to communicate, let's talk about some application. Number one, I must believe that whatever I'm in the middle of, Jesus is on top of it. That he's interceding in the mountains. The Bible says that he actually cares for the birds in the sky, and that he clothes the lilies in the field, and yet you are greater than that part of his creation. Can I ask you a question? Do you see him active in your daily life? He's saying, man, I'm so active in the life of the birds, y'all. He's like, look at this worm I created. (laughs) There you go, bird. There you go, oh, watch, these people, like, they just cut their grass. Like, that's one, one of the most fascinating things. That if you want to, like, really connect with God, mow your yard and then go sit on your porch and watch what happens. Every year when I mow my yard, hundreds of birds end up in my yard. And what are they doing? They're, they're getting now, now they're closer to the soil. But you know what else they're doing? They're carrying off those blades of grass to go build their house. What? Are you kidding me? God is so good. And he's like, 
you see how like those birds are building their house? They're not, they don't have a care in the world. They're like, hey, we got to stop at the lumber yard today. You know, do we have any money to buy lumber? They're just like, hey, man, dude's cutting his yard. We about to build. <laughs> That's fascinating. And he loves birds that much. And he says, you're even greater. I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I am active in the life of my creation. He's not up there so far away from you that he doesn't even, he's just like, he, he needs you to somehow make him aware of what's going on. He's like, man, I'm here. I'm in the, I'm in the storm with you. I'm in the struggle with you. He's calming my chaos and driving out what's been driving in. Can I tell you, whatever I'm worried about, Jesus walks on. When the disciples saw Jesus, don't miss this, they thought he was Patrick Swayze, y'all. Only 90s people get that, sorry. It's a movie called Ghost, Patrick Swayze was in it. Anyways, take joke out for third experience. Okay, got it. <laughs> so they thought they saw a ghost. You know why? Because in our greatest moments of anxiety, Whatever haunts us comes to the surface. You realize that God created anxiety to be a good thing. There's a thing called acute anxiety. Acute anxiety is that moment, you know, like when you're driving down the road and like a deer runs out in front of you and all of a sudden your body locks up. You got like these quick reflexes, adrenaline's pumping and you're like basically you avoid danger, Right? That's why God created that anxiety is to help actually protect us and save us. When we encounter something that could harm us, we get away from it quickly, right? That's what God's trying to do. But most of us do not live with acute anxiety. We live with chronic anxiety. And chronic anxiety, listen, in acute anxiety, you know that when the situation, when you have a few minutes to gather your thoughts, clean yourself, what begins to happen? Your heart rate goes back down you kind of come back to normal a little bit. Why? Because the threat is gone. But people who live with chronic anxiety, the threat never goes away. But here's the thing, the threat's not real. People who live with chronic anxiety, they're haunted by a threat that's not really there. And it's usually birthed out of something that happened to them when they were younger. It's that deep insecurity that, man, somebody, they're going to leave you eventually. So why don't you just do the leaving first? And that's why you struggle in relationship and relationship, marriage after marriage, because there's still something birthed deep in you that you have not allowed Jesus to drive out of you. And now when your greatest times of tension, I always tell people, you want to know how your soul is doing? Encounter major interruptions and difficult people. And that will reveal to you where your heart and your soul really is. It's not when the waters are calm that we know what's going on inside. It's when our life is in chaos that we realize, man, my soul is in chaos. You see, my struggles in chaos remind me that my Savior is close. You see, I must recognize His presence and His voice. Why do I know this? Because that's what he came to drive out. I always tell people, if you want to know where God is, go find the addict on the street, the poor, the brokenhearted, the grieving, the mourning. That's where God is. Why? Because that's where he said he would be, near to the brokenhearted. God is not, his presence is not just found in the holy, clean places. This is not where, this, God's here, don't get me wrong, but he, he wants to be near. So that, that means if I am in my most dark, broken, chaotic moment, God is close. I'm closer to God than I ever thought I could be. He's close. And you know what's amazing is so many of us have trouble with that? We live in a society and a culture that is obsessed with supernatural stuff. We got more Christians so enthralled with witchcraft than ever before. It's really strange and weird. And it's crazy because, like, everybody's, like, crazy about this stuff. And it's crazy because we are obsessed with the supernatural, but we, yet we don't believe God can do the super in our natural. Can I ask you this question? 
Do you truly believe you can be 100% free? Because I do. I do. I've seen it happen in my own life. Overnight? No. But the more I allow Jesus in my boat to drive out my chaos, I find that he always leads me to the other side. Day by day. Last but not least, how do we, how we handle our present mess is determined by remembering his past miracles. The disciples just witnessed and inc- they've already they've already been through this once, y'all. This is like a rerun. What are we doing? Did y'all not watch the first episode when Jesus calmed the storm? And now they're like, Oh no, we're gonna die again. And it's this moment, and they forgot. But aren't we just like them? We'll have moments of miracles where God softens our heart, and then we'll turn around and have short term memory loss. We forget that He's been faithful. Can I ask you a question? Where do you see a ghost that you should see His grace? Where are the moments that when chaos comes in your life, all you tend to do is look at all of the bad and negative and all of the hurt and pain and turmoil, or do you see, wait a minute, if chaos is here, God is close because he came to drive the chaos out. And I need to look to him. I need to notice him. Because I don't know about you, but I do not want him to just pass me by. We forget that he's been faithful. Can I tell you what our, our greatest struggle is? Our greatest struggle is driving against the Christ who wants to drive the chaos out of me. Because I want you to know today, you're either struggling with God or against him. That's where you're at today. This is where it gets, where, where Mark ties this beautiful bow. Remember, we start off chapter 6, and he is rejected by his own people. And then you get to the end of the story. The Bible says they get to the other side of the lake. And did y'all catch this? Like, this blew my mind when I read this in verse 30, or 54. They brought the boat to the shore and climbed out. The people recognized Jesus at once like the moment he got out of the boat they're like the son of man is here the messiah is here go get your sick go get your addicted bring that broken marriage here I need you to go door to door and tell everybody Jesus has showed up on the scene and I'm telling you he came to drive he came to deal with your mess he came to drive out your chaos he came to drive out your addiction he came to drive out your bitterness drive out your unforgiveness drive out all of these things he's here they recognized him at once and so don't miss this what you see at the beginning of the chapter is you have a group of people who rejected and a group of people who recede. And in that rejection and reception, the main thing is the middle, and the middle is recognition. You had one people, those who were closest to him, yet did not recognize him. And it reminds us that those furthest from him are those who will recognize his voice first. Why? Because for some of you, you've gotten way too familiarized with church and Christianity that you have not made yourself familiar with Jesus. His voice and his presence. Am I struggling with God or against him? Do I have short-term memory loss over what he's already done in my life? Do I see a ghost when I should see grace? So I want us to respond today. And I'm going to challenge you with just three things to think about and pray about and respond with. One is this. Don't just struggle. Get stronger. Don't just struggle. Get stronger. And here's what I want to say about that. How is my struggle driving me deeper into prayer, Bible reading, community with other believers? 
Because know this, if my struggle is driving me away from those things, you are caught in your own chaos. And you are struggling against God. Because God will never drive you away from those things. When I finally allow Him to be the one, the wind behind my sails, in my struggle, He will always drive me towards a deeper prayer life. Always drive me toward a deeper understanding of His Word. He will always drive me towards a community that's going to hold me accountable, encourage me. I've seen it time after time after time again. When you see people like, man, I haven't seen you at church. I don't see you serving anymore. I don't see you in community anymore. Man, I'm just struggling. Well, you're struggling against God, not with Him. Because if you disappear from where God is actually placing you to give you strength, you are struggling against the very thing he's trying to deliver you from. Are y'all hearing me today? Am I allowing him to drive me toward healing and salvation? Or am I rejecting it? The second thing, get familiar with his voice. Guess what that requires? Prayer. Bible reading it requires for me to sit still long enough to listen. Some of us are like, man, I, I haven't heard from, I really don't hear from God. God hasn't spoke to me. I don't feel like his presence is with me. Let me ask you a few questions. Was there a word from somebody that you ignored? Was there a sermon you slept through? Was there a conviction that you ignored? Because I want to tell you something. That was probably God speaking, but you were too busy to turn aside and see that that was his presence because you know how the majority of the time God will speak he'll speak through his word and he will speak through people who have been in his word and I'm telling you if your only prayer life is you listening to the sound of your own voice talking you probably won't recognize the voice of Jesus because you only hear yourself talking one of the greatest ways to pray is just to sit in silence every morning I start my day off with Gratitude, and then silence and solitude. Sometimes longer than others, but sometimes it's only 10 minutes. And let me tell you something. Sometimes my prayer life, is, it feels like a bunch of bananas, in a, a bunch of monkeys in a banana tree going quite crazy. I don't know about you, but every time I try to sit still, it's like your thoughts just go haywire. But then sometimes, man, I feel his presence. And I just begin to write down what's on my heart and my mind because I know that he's speaking to me and through me. And that leads me to the last one, and that is live a life of gratitude. You know what I've been able to do over the years? Since every day that I start my day off by writing down at least five things I'm grateful for, I'm able to look back and see his faithfulness. On the days where gratitude feels hard, I'm, rem I'm reminded, but he's done it before. And he'll do it again. Sometimes your entire direction is shaped by your gratitude or lack thereof. Because I've been through some moments where it's been a struggle. But I'm here to tell you, I've learned that I can control one thing, and that is whether or not I'm struggling against God or with Him.